Welcome to the Monday evening Introduction to Philosophy and Theory live stream lecture. My name is Julian, and I'm so glad that you're with me today. Were you saying something? I know, I think there's still music playing in the background. I can't really turn it off. Um, that's just how it's going to be. Um, I am currently in Freiburg, Germany. In fact, I'm staying in this lovely old historical cottage. It's called the uh, Das Alte Kutsche House, uh, and it used to belong supposedly to a, a Kutsche, someone who would drive the carriages for, uh, for the locals who lived here. It's a beautiful historic location, and Freiburg is, of course, a beautiful historic town, and so I'm very glad to be here. Um, I actually studied here for a while, so it's quite nice to be back. Uh, if you're curious what we're going to be doing today, today I'm going to give you an explainer, a brief introduction to one of Hegel's most well-known concepts, namely the idea of the night of the world, uh, or die Nacht der Welt. And if you're joining for the first time, this is a weekly series where I try to break down philosophical ideas and concepts in a way that um, will hopefully make them accessible without dumbing them down. That's the, that's the premise here. Please do drop a comment letting me know where you're joining from. I see someone from Croatia. I hear that the music is too loud. I'm afraid that if I try to turn off the music, it'll turn off the live stream. Yeah, that's what happened. We've lost the live stream. That's very unfortunate. Oh, now we've lost the YouTube as well. <laughs> Let's see if we can reset this. Oh, I think we're back. Hello, everybody. We are back. I see someone joining from India. Hello, India. I see Michigan, US. Hello, nice to see you. Trinidad, it's such a pleasure that people are joining from around the world. I see Taiwan. Hello, hello. Uh, Nepal, greetings to everyone. And I myself am currently in Freiburg, Germany. This is an ongoing philosophy series, and my goal is, as I said before, to make these ideas available on the internet, open access, and accessible. However, if you'd like to download my Guide to Hegel ebook, you can find that on Patreon, plus a whole bunch of extra educational materials. And if you become a patron, that actually helps me keep these live stream lectures free for everybody else. So a huge Huge thank you to all of our patrons, and please do consider becoming a patron by either clicking the link in, in my bio or going to www.patreon.com forward slash Julian Philosophy. And once again, greetings to everybody joining us from around the world. I see you, and I feel incredibly uplifted. And yes, I am indeed an Andrew Bird fan. I see someone commenting on this in, in the comments. Uh, that makes me very happy. Okay, so let's dive right in. And today I want to continue where we left off last week, which I'd like to talk about Hegel's concept of the night of the world, or die Nacht der Welt. In fact, in the passage about the night of the world, Hegel writes that this night is in fact the subject, or der Mensch selbst. Diese Nacht ist der Mensch selbst. Essentially, Hegel characterizes subjectivity, or being alive, as a kind of night, and this night is the night of the world. So in its most basic formula, Hegel essentially argues that humanity, human subjectivity, humankind, equals the night of the world. But as per usual with Hegel, that doesn't tell us very much. What is the night of the world? That's what I'm going to try to explain in the following live stream. I'm going to try to keep it relatively short today. Um, you may already hear from my voice that I've come down with a little bit of a head cold. Nothing too serious, but enough that I don't want to overdo it. So I'm going to try to be to the point as much as I can. Now, the concept of the night of the world uh, is a concept that Hegel comes up with relatively early in his career, in his Jena Real Philosophie. And essentially, it's a very poetic description, quite a dramatic description of Hegel's argument about subjectivity. In fact, he says that if you want to discover the night of the world, all you have to do is look another human being in the eye. He says, when one eye looks into another, here you find the night of the world reflected back through this gaze, as it were. In fact, the idea of the image is very important to Hegel. Hegel argues that so the subject is a composite of an infinite 
amount of variations of what he calls images. And so clearly for Hegel, the idea of seeing, of positing, of the subject recognizing himself in another is a part of what he calls the night of the world. However, when Hegel talks about the night of the world, he isn't just trying to present us with this sort of existentialist, nihilist image. It's not, even though it might seem similar to Nietzsche's idea that if you gaze into the abyss, the abyss, the abyss gazes back at you, he's fundamentally making a very different argument. In fact, when Hegel posits that the night of the world is like looking into another person's eyes and seeing a nothingness reflected back to you, he's essentially making a tautological argument. He's arguing that if you put one subject in front of another subject, that what is reflected back between these two subjects is nothing. Or to put it in a formula, that if we have A equals A, in other words, a tautological overlap, that there is nothing of substance that is exchanged. In fact, if you make a leap forward, and you go to Hegel's preface to the phenomenology of spirits, you can actually see him returning to this motif of the night and of A equals A. Hegel has a passage in which he's very critical of philosophy as it exists in his age. He says that philosophy is so preoccupied with the idea of the absolute, with the discovery of the absolute as if it were a foreign continent, that it posits the absolute as A equals A, as something that is a priori, that is an absolute substance, a kind of divine utopia, as it were. In fact, the way in which Hegel describes it in the preface to the Phenomenology of Spirit <clears throat> is that he says that philosophers have become like men who are in the desert, who are so thirsty for the divine that they crave even a drop of water as if it would bring them their salvation. Essentially what he's arguing is that the entire project of philosophy had become so preoccupied with the idea of a transcendental absolute or pure form, like the holy grail of the platonic metaphysical system, that any particular emanation was therefore considered almost a trickle down example of this divine. This is essentially an attack on romanticism. One of the romantic arguments was that when you found beauty in the world, you saw therein a reflection of the divine good. That a beautiful person or a beautiful landscape was therefore a particular emanation from an absolute or divine good. And even the more creative or, let's say, more serious intellectual romantics like Schelling or before him, even one could even add to this list Kant, the idea was that the sublime wasn't simply a particular representation of the divine. It wasn't like having a vision of the divine. Instead, the sublime was precisely that which <clears throat> went beyond the logic of ordinary appearances and therein reflected the unknowing aspect of God or the absolute. For example, a romantic could depict a storm, a raging storm, as this unknowable, overwhelming, illogical force of nature that therein represented the unknowable, illogical force of the divine. <clears throat> and here, in fact, I think this is actually quite interesting to, to present. Here we have two versions of the sublime. We have the romantic idea of the sublime that we find within the philosophy of Kant, and then we have what you could call the Burkean sublime, which precedes it, which is the romantic trickle-down idea of the sublime. The Burkean sublime essentially argues that whenever you see beauty in the world, we have here a trickle-down effect of the ultimate good, of the ultimate beautiful. That a beautiful painting, or a beautiful house, or a beautiful woman, or anything that is considered to be the pinnacle of a certain aesthetic is therefore touched by God is, is uh, something that is proof of the existence of some higher good. Now, this is a relatively simplistic idea. Of course, it belies this assumption that some people would be chosen by God and that therefore to be more attractive or more beautiful makes you stand out as being one of the elected ones, etc. Once you start pulling 
at this idea, it reveals itself as being a little bit thin. However, Kant's idea of the sublime, the Kantian sublime is already more challenging, more interesting. Basically, the idea is that the sublime is precisely that which cannot be reconciled with either the divine or the particular, something which stands out as being irreconcilable, something that doesn't fit into our categories of knowledge or understanding. In fact, I was recently, I recently watched the movie Maestro about Leonard Bernstein, the conductor, and the film begins with a quote by Bernstein in which he defines art, which is very similar to the Kantian sublime. He says, art does not answer questions. Instead, it raises them. And in the inevitable tension between competing interpretations and answers, therein we find the purpose of art. And this is similar for the Kantian sublime. It's the idea that the sublime isn't a direct particular emanation of the divine form, or the platonic pure form, if you will. But it's said that when we find things that are irreconcilable, that seem to go beyond ordinary standards of beauty or understanding, that this tension is itself <clears throat> indicative of the very tension between the particular and the absolute, between the divine and the worldly, between noumenon and phenomenon, between essence and appearance, if you will. These are all different names for what is fundamentally the same metaphysical system, a formalism, if you will, between the absolute and the world of subjectivity and appearances. And Hegel is very much against this. Hegel's argument is against formalism of any kind. This distinction between the world of appearances, the world of phenomena, and the noumenon, the idea of an essence that lies outside the world of appearance, an a priori absolute, is for Hegel suspicious. Hence why he argues that <clears throat> if the absolute is supposed to be barred from us, remains outside of our reach, which is, of course, what Kant argued in his critique of pure reason, then we are all starved for the absolute, and that we are like uh, thirsty men in a desert craving for a drop that will set us free. Hegel is very much against this image. In fact, it's in the preface to the Phenomenology of Spirit that Hegel comes up with another example, <clears throat> excuse me, that relates to the night. Here it is not the night of the world. It is instead the night of the absolute. In fact, it's quite important to stress that whenever Hegel uses this example of a night or Nacht in German, <clears throat> that he's fundamentally talking about different conceptualizations of the absolute. There's the romantic notion of the absolute, which Hegel rejects, and then there's the dialectical notion of the absolute, which Hegel embraces or accepts. In fact, he posits it. And in his idea of the night of the world, he's, he, 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 as, as I will explain, he sets out a dialectical theory of the absolute, which he rejects in the preface of the, uh, which, uh, which, which rejects the absolute idea of the night of the night of the world. Anyway, I'm making this too difficult, as per usual with Hegel. So, in the preface to the Phenomenology of Spirit, Hegel describes the current state of philosophy like this. He says, the current state of philosophy has created a night which is so absolute that in it, all cows are black. Now, why would Hegel argue that the contemporary state of romantic philosophy argues that at night all cows are black? Well, fundamentally, he's, it's, it's a little pun, it's a game. He's using a common expression, which I think today actually is still used, it's an idiom that's used in Spanish, which is that at night all cats are black. In other words, if you think about it, during the day when the sun is shining, cats can have different colors. They can be white or tabby or black. But at night, when you turn off the light, strictly speaking, all cats are black. They all appear to us in the exact same way. It could be a white cat. It would still look like a black cat. And Hegel makes the same argument about romantic idealism, about romantic notions of the absolute as a divine given form. Namely, he says, 
If the absolute is absolute, if A equals A, the formalism which he rejects, then this means that fundamentally everything in the world appears as a reflection of this absolute black. And because Hegel is making fun of the romantics, he, instead of saying at night all, all cats are black, he says at night all cows are black, which is sort of a more vulgar version of the same expression. He essentially accuses philosophy and the romantic idealists of positing an absolute which creates a subjectivity that is completely bland, a priori rejected. If, as it is for Kant, fundamentally everything that appears to you, all phenomena, are illusions, are lies, are dejected versions or barriers that keep us from the absolute, then this means that the absolute remains absolute if it were not for the subject. Fundamentally, you could imagine us like, like this. You could imagine that uh, between you, the subject, between you and the divine, or between you and the absolute, capital T truth, there lies a screen, like an iron curtain that you can't get beyond, and that everybody is left scratching at it. And that the idea is that behind this iron curtain lies the absolute. Everything is perfect. Everything is ideal. And Hegel's very frustrated with this image. He doesn't believe that there's anything behind the curtain. In fact, this is also Hegel's theory. He has many versions of this. Hegel's theory of heaven. Hegel essentially argues that paradise, strictly speaking, isn't paradise before the fall. That paradise becomes paradise in its proper true nature only by means of the fall from grace, the fall from heaven. That once Adam and Eve are banished from the Garden of Eden, only then does it truly become Eden. Not because it's Eden without them, but because Eden or paradise is a subjective frame through which the conditions of paradise are made manifest. That before Adam and Eve were ejected from paradise, paradise wasn't yet in its true form. In other words, that the fall retroactively generates that from which it has fallen. Now, you can find this in contemporary maxims that simplify it into a popular wisdom, like the uh, famous philosophical message in the Nintendo loading screen, all that, is, uh, all that is not saved will be lost, etc. Or you don't appreciate something until you've lost it. But that's not really Hegel's point. He's not saying that Adam and Eve couldn't appreciate heaven until they had left it, until they could no longer return, or not heaven, but Eden, if you will. Instead, Hegel's argument is that Eden only becomes paradise by means of it being no longer accessible, by means of there being an, an in or non-transcendable barrier between human subjects and the Garden of Eden. Essentially, he's making here a theological argument, which is the equivalent of his metaphysical one, which is that if we posit that the pure form, the absolute, A equals A, is perfection, but it lies beyond the realm of human cognition, beyond the world of appearances, then, strictly speaking for Hegel, there was no point at which humanity was in this pure form. That this pure form only appears to us through the subjective stance of having lost it, of it being irretrievably lost. And so Hegel essentially posits that the truth doesn't lie beyond the barrier. The truth lies in the barrier. Which is another way of saying that the truth doesn't lie in the content of the absolute, which is supposed to be behind this transcendental curtain. It's that the truth is the truth of the structural or formal relations through which this content of the absolute is itself conceptualized. Which is another way of saying that, to again, make it very simple, if we have, on the one hand, subject, subjectivity, and on the other hand, pure content, absolute, and between these two worlds lies a barrier, an iron curtain. Hegel says, what if there's nothing behind the iron curtain? What, it's not, what if it's not the truth behind the curtain? What, it's the tr what if it's the truth 
of our relationship to the truth as such. In other words, Hegel is less preoccupied with the content of a transcendental a priori, the absolute, and instead he's interested in the content of the structural or formal relations that the subject has to the notion of the absolute, which leads Hegel to this really radical argument, which is that the absolute isn't the thing that lies beyond the barrier. The absolute is the knowledge of the subject as to the structural conditions by which the absolute is hidden. And so, strictly speaking, it's like the pot at the end of the rainbow, the pot of gold. It's not a place you can go to. It's not you can go to the spot and you will find the holy grail of metaphysical transcendental knowledge. All you can achieve is the knowledge of the manner in which this pot of gold is barred from you. Essentially, his response to Kant, therefore, is that what Kant saw as a problem that couldn't be solved is, in fact, its own solution. And so when, when Hegel argues against formalism, when he argues against this metaphysical binary of the absolute versus the world of appearances, of the noumenon versus the phenomenon, he's actually not a relativist. He's not saying all formalism is bad. He's against the specific type of formalism, the formalism that posits an a priori absolute, A equals A. And instead what he wants is a formalism of a kind, but a formalism of a radically different kind. He wants a formalism, if you will, of an anti-form, a formalism of anti-formalism. And what could be the word for a formalism of anti-formalism? Well, the definition of that is the dialectic. The dialectic, strictly speaking, is a formalism, but it's a formalism of anti-formalism. In other words, it rejects the notion of a transcendental content and instead finds an almost sublime, namely impossible content within the knowledge of the structural conditions of impossibility of the metaphysical formalism. Now, when you hear this, certain philosophy students and professors will, will perhaps be upset because to call a Hegel a formalist seems to be almost like a form of treason within philosophy, because Hegel is usually taught as being the anti-formalist par excellence. In fact, even those simplifications of Hegel that some people learn in school, like the triad thesis, antithesis, synthesis, are primarily rejected because of their apparent formulaic nature, because of their formalism. And yet, fundamentally, I believe that you can make the argument that Hegel's dialectic is none other no more, no less, than a formalism of anti-formalism. Now, let's take a look at how this can be found in Hegel's idea of the night of the world. Remember, in his passage in the Jena Real philosophy on the night of the world, he essentially says, the subject equals the night of the world. And we already know that for Hegel, the night is the night in which, of course, he develops this later, but it's clearly an idea he's thinking about, that this night is the night in which all cows are black. In other words, for Hegel, night or Nacht equals an a priori absolute. And so we know that when Hegel talks about the night, he means an absolute. However, we also know that Hegel argues against an a priori pure absolute. So why is Hegel now, who is against the idea of the absolute, suddenly arguing for it? This is the distinction between the idea of the absolute as the night and the absolute as the night of the world, which is the subject. In other words, Hegel radically undermines the previously existing metaphysical formalism by suggesting that the subject is not the irreducible stain that tarnishes the absolute, but that it is only within subjectivity that we find the absolute. And now you can see again Hegel's idea, how Hegel's idea works about looking into somebody else's eyes. He says, when you look into somebody else's eyes, when you gaze deep into their eyes, you see the night of the world reflected back to you. 
which is another way of saying that you see nothing reflected back to you, that there's nothing behind that person's eyes. It's very different from Shakespeare's romantic notion that the eyes are the windows to the soul. Hegel's essentially arguing that when you look deeply into somebody's eyes, there's no one at home. There's nothing behind this curtain. In fact, here, if we put it in a formula again, instead of having the absolute, which is pure, namely A equals A, Hegel argues for an absolute that is reflected only in two non-absolute particular gazes, namely A, B, B, A. If the subject refracts the subject, and supposedly the subject is itself a refraction of the absolute, then we have here two negations negating each other, namely determinate negation. Or, if you want to put it in a chiasmic formula, we have here A, B, X, B, A. Namely, the truth, capital T truth, is not A equals A. The truth lies in the formal relations, the structural impossibility of an a priori content of the absolute. A, B, X being Hegel's absolute of determinate negation, the night of the world. B, A. If the subject, who is supposedly has the absolute behind his eyes, looks at another subject, who also supposedly has the absolute behind his eyes, and finds nothing in there, then this nothingness is refracted back onto the subject, therefore retroactively determining his nothingness, and in the collision of these two empty vessels, we find, miraculously, the truth, which is that there is no one home, that there is no a priori absolute, that the absolute is therefore the subject knowing the structural conditions as to the impossibility of the manifestation of the absolute as a pure form. I say it once again. Therefore, the night of the world is what Hegel deems pure self. Here Hegel's almost being ironic because Hegel doesn't believe in the idea of a pure self. However, Hegel believes that the immutable impossibility of pure selfhood is itself absolute. It's similar to make a leap here. It's similar to the Lacanian psychoanalytic notion that the only thing which is absolute is difference. In fact, Zizek, Slavoj Zizek, goes back to this Hegelian night in the world over and over and over again from a Lacanian position. Because if for Lacan, the only thing which is universal is difference, if the only thing which is absolute is particular negation, the same thing is true for Hegel. The only thing which is absolute is the self-relating negativity of the subject. Therefore, the absolute is not something which lies in a transcendental, non-accessible location, some site. It's that it is the absolute condition of the self-relating negativity of subjectivity. Now, once again, for those of you who have listened to these live stream lectures before, this is, of course, very abstract, right? This is not something that necessarily easily translates into a list of things that you can implement in your life. And this is why it's actually quite interesting to look at the preface to Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit. Because Hegel approaches, it's one of the few instances in which Hegel is quite self-reflective. He approaches this problem. He says, and I'm simplifying here, of course, because Hegel's saying it, so it's a bit more abstract. Hegel says, the task of philosophy has split, essentially, into two pathways, either we have this highly abstract desire to find the ultimate, the pure form, the absolute. This is the image I mentioned earlier where we're starving or we're, we're, we're all uh, desolate, we're thirsty in the desert. But then Hegel says this is juxtaposed with the opposite inclination, which is to use philosophy as a how-to manual, as a guide for life, which is to say either philosophy is engaged purely 
with the absolute. Or it forgets about the absolute and engages purely with the particular, with the world as we know it, with life as you know it, with actionable pieces or nuggets of wisdom that you can implement in your own life. And Hegel basically rejects both these categories. He rejects the pure idealism of transcendental metaphysics, but he also rejects the idea that philosophy is simply another one of the sciences which can be applied to life so as to better know it or to learn more about life. Essentially what Hegel is arguing is that he wants a system of philosophy which takes both into account. Think about it. The transcendental romantic idealist pretends like the world doesn't exist, like the world is an inconvenient distraction. In fact, something which takes us away from the absolute. That therefore the goal is to be reunited with the absolute, to think it in its pure form and to leave everything else beside. On the other hand, scientists and philosophers who are interested in science argue that philosophy can be one of the many ways in which we learn to lead better lives, in which we implement better lifestyle practices, etc. And they leave behind the transcendental dimension of philosophy. And this Hegel rejects as well. Hegel's system, therefore, and as I argued last week, Hegel is perhaps the greatest systematizer of philosophy since Plato. Hegel's system, therefore, seeks to combine absolute transcendental idealism with a brutally subjective view on the quote-unquote real world. In fact, it's one of the ironies that many people who teach Hegel, and certainly many people who criticize Hegel, argue that Hegel is an obscurantist mysticist who pretends that nothing in the world matters and that everything is preordained, that there's a historical, historically determined path that we're all following. In the same way, people who teach Marxism as being the person who brings as Marx as being the person who brings Hegel down to earth, therefore miss the point. Hegel wants to reunite the emphasis on the subject with the emphasis on the absolute. He wants to take A equals A, namely transcendental idealism, and A X B, namely Fichtian subjectivity, which is that A uh, sorry, and A equals B, apologies, Fichtian subjectivity, Ich philosophy. He wants to unite them. To, to briefly contextualize, I mentioned this last week, but if you're joining for the first time, the two predominant philosophical responses to Kantian metaphysics were the schools of, I mean, they weren't fully fledged schools, but were the, 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 the uh, theories of, on the one hand, Fichte, who came up with a radical theory of subjectivity, in which it was not that the subject was a fallen emanation from the absolute, but instead that the subject posited the absolute. In other words, he placed emphasis on the subject. This was his Ich or I philosophy, immensely popular at the University of Vienna. Um, interesting, but uh, also akin to what today we would call self-help and certainly part of the vogue at the time for individualization. And, and, and the desire for uh, individual change versus the Schillingian Naturphilosophie or philosophy of nature, which was more, much more mystical than Hegel's thought, which posited a kind of Urgrund, a, 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 a primordial foundation upon which, the, uh, upon which everything in the world was based, an absolute that was purely absolute. And Hegel wants to combine these. The Schillingian absolute, which is much more uh, radical in its idealism than Kant is, essentially posits A equals A. The absolute is absolute. The Fichtian argument about the absolute posits that the subject creates or posits the absolute. So A equals B, or if you want to be more strict about it, B equals A. Both of these theories Hegel rejected as being formalisms, formal attitudes that derived from the formal problem that Kant 
had proposed. Kant's famous antinomies. Hegel himself, as I argued before, therefore comes up with a formalism of anti-formalism, which is to take A equals A and A equals B, the Fichtian position and the Schlingian positions, or the other way around, and to combine them into a chiasmic formula. Namely, the absolute can now be put as follows. A, B, X, B, A. The truth, X, does not lie on either side of the transcendental divide. It is neither within the subject, nor is it beyond the transcendental curtain of subjectivity, the absolute beyond. Instead, it is the truth of the formal relation of impossibility between the subject, B, and the absolute as pure form, A. A negated into B, B negated into B, negated into A. Or, to put it again in formal terms, A, B, X, B, A. And this X is therefore an absolute, but an absolute which only exists as the content of the self-relating negativity between A and B. And therefore, A and B are always already related, ne uh, uh, sorry, uh, negatively determined through A and B, the night of the world. And for Hegel, the night of the world, the night of the world, which is the subject, is therefore the absolute or Geist, spirit. Namely, neither A nor B, but the X that emerges when B meets B and both refract the empty space of the absent absolute. Namely, when you look into the eye of somebody else and you see nothing looking back at you, as Hegel puts it. Therefore, if you were to take notes, if you were to be very formulaic, which uh, might help, but it's certainly not really what Hegel has in mind, you would say absolute equals spirit. Spirit equals subject. However, since there is no absolute spirit, there can be no absolute subject, which means that the subject is the negation of the absolute, and when the subject negates through another subject, we have not the absolute of the a priori, we have instead the truth of the immutable impossibility of the absolute in its own form, which is X. Of course, that is hugely complicated. So my argument, my proposal, would be to say, simplify that. Put it in a chiasmic formula. A, B, X, B, A. A equals absolute. B equals subject. X equals spirit. And spirit, therefore, can only be understood in this formula, which is the formula of anti-formalism, for which another word is the dialectic. And so to summarize very quickly, Hegel's concept of the night of the world posits that this night, which for him is the night of the absolute, can be seen in two ways. Either the romantic transcendental notion of an a priori pure form, an absolute which is absolute, or it is the night of the world, which is that what makes the absolute absolute is that it is absolutely impermeable, that it cannot be accessed. And Hegel therefore says that the truth of Kant is that Kant believed that the barrier between human cognition and the absolute was absolute. Hegel simply argues that what Kant couldn't see and hence why Hegel radicalizes Kant, is that the absolute doesn't lie beyond this transcendental barrier. Instead, the absolute is the truth of the structural relations of this impossibility as such, namely spirit. And so Hegel's rejection of formalism is the rejection of the notion of an absolute, which is A equals A. Instead, Hegel posits 
what I would argue is a formalism of anti-formalism, in which spirit or geist is the name of an absolute which exists only through the determinate relations, namely that of negative determination, of the conditions of structural impossibility by which the absolute retroactively emerges through its negation into subjectivity, subjectivity being the interrelating negativity of the subject amongst other subjects. And this nothing, this night of the world, is therefore the nothing which contains the truth, that everything lies within this nothing, the multitude of images. Truth is therefore not one thing that lies beyond this barrier. It is the truth of the structural relations by which truth can be known or understood. And now Hegel has the solution to the problem which he posits in the preface to the Phenomenology of Spirit. Remember, Hegel posited that philosophy was stuck because either it was preoccupied with the absolute or it was preoccupied only with the world. Either it was a theosophical mysticism that wanted to be reunited with the ideal or it was a practical how philosophy can help you live your life attitude. And Hegel says, what if the only way to be reunited with the absolute the knowledge of the absolute is therefore to know absolutely the structural relations by which the absolute cannot be known. That is Hegel's argument. Of course, it's something that can't be simplified into a formula, which is the whole point. And so Hegel's philosophy is very hopeful. It's important to, to contextualize here that after Kant, Philosophy was in a state of disarray because Kant essentially upheld the idea <clears throat> of an unknowable transcendental horizon that couldn't be reached. In fact, I think it's Schopenhauer's quip that what Kant effectively did was that Kant was like a man at a ball who spent the entire night flirting with a masked woman only to realize that underneath the mask was his wife all along. And the way in which that's a criticism of Kantian metaphysics is that Kant flirts with the idea of a transcendental divine that can be known, but then essentially argues at the end of it that it is all along the unknowable transcendental divine of the absolute that can't be known. And after the Kantian metaphysical challenge, which basically consists can't be solved, we have the Fichtian position that goes all in on subjectivity. And we have the Schillingian position that goes all in on idealism. And Hegel arrives, and Hegel questions the very notion as to the absolute nature of the absolute. A equals A, the undifferentiated notion of the pure form. And Hegel's therefore one of the first philosophers to argue that we should reject the formalism of content versus form, content versus appearance, noumenon versus phenomenon, and instead introduces what becomes the beginning of a post-metaphysical system without which Marxism would not be possible, without which the critique of ideology would not be possible, without which psychoanalysis would not be possible, by which the central governing principle, the logic, is therefore that the truth is not the truth of something's essence. It is the truth of the structural relations between the appearance of truth and the production of truth. That therefore the subject posits truth by means of not being able to access it. That the subject becomes an irreducible element which is constitutive to the absolute precisely by means of being the staging ground for the absolute's disappearance. I apologize for those of you listening on Instagram right now. We appear to have lost the connection at the, the most important point. You can, however, if you are watching on YouTube, still follow these lectures. Hello, I believe we're back on Instagram. Apologies for the poor connection. 
on Instagram. Uh, you can also watch us on YouTube or you can download the lecture on Patreon. Apologies again for the poor internet connection. Now, we've already bitten off more than we can chew here, so hopefully you will return next week as we continue this discussion on Hegel, but hopefully this has been something that has piqued your interest and made you curious about he Hegelian philosophy, which I will continue to argue is perhaps the most crucial moment in the development of philosophy since Plato and Aristotle. At least that is my belief. Hopefully this will have helped you understand the idea of the night of the world and why it's crucial for understanding Hegelian philosophy. Thank you so much for joining me today. And for those of you who are patrons, I'm gonna be hosting a post live stream Q and A in a couple of minutes. So please do join me on Discord or download the members only podcast. Thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you soon.